You know, I can remember when I was 19 years old, I was on staff at a church at the time, uh, working with their junior high ministry, and uh, I was teaching a junior high boys Sunday school class. Now, junior high boys are interesting enough, but teaching a junior high Sunday school class with 19 boys, let me tell you, it's an adventure. And I know some of you have had an experience of, of teaching that group. I remember we were going through a series talking about the different names of God, and this was our very first class. And uh, I remember beginning the class by asking if, if anybody knew any of the names of God. Dead silence. Nobody said anything. We waited until finally one boy at the back of the room put up his hand and uh, stood up, and he said, I know God's first name. And he said, God's first name is Andy. And I kind of scratched my head and wondered, Andy. So I asked the boy, I said, Andy? And he said, yeah, Andy. He said, we sang about him last Sunday. So by this time, you can imagine the other uh, junior high boys were almost rolling off their chairs laughing. So I asked this boy um, to sing us a few bars of this song that he sang last Sunday. So he cleared his throat and sang, Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. Well, you've got to love junior high boys, don't you? This morning, I want us to look at something that I need to confess to you up front that I do feel somewhat uncomfortable with, and I think that we all do. I want us to look at what God expects of us in terms of serving Him. We want to look at the real cost of serving Christ. I think that we all feel somewhat uncomfortable when we read Jesus saying that those who follow him need to deny themselves, take up their cross, and then follow him. I think that we also, some of us anyways, hang our head in shame when we hear Paul saying that we, what we should really all be able to say in that the things that you have seen in me, you go and do as well. What Paul is saying there is he's saying, look at me if you want to know what a Christian is like. Look at me if you want to know something about what Christ was like. What powerful words. How I wish that we could say them all the time. I feel so uncomfortable talking about this because I know that uh, I am no example of it. I know that I fall very, very short of God's standard for us. You know, so much of what we read about Paul and see in the life of Jesus is really putting before us a very, very radical idea of what serving the Lord really is. You know, I, I checked the dictionary, and the dictionary has some 27 different definitions for service and what it means to serve. But Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, gives us one very vivid and one very straightforward definition of what it means to serve Christ. And that's precisely what it is that we want to look at in this morning's service. Before we do that, let's pray and commit this, this message to the Lord. Father, we've all come here this morning believing that you have something that you want to say to us. Father, we ask this morning that you would do that. We ask this morning that you would open our hearts up to discover what it really means to serve you. Father, where a challenge is necessary in an individual heart, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work. We commit this to you, Lord. Amen. Well, if I were to ask a number of Christians how they serve God, how do you think they would answer that? Well, they might point to the Sunday school class that they teach. They might point to the Awana group that they lead, or they may even uh, point to the small group that they're in charge of, or maybe even the choir that they sing in. All tremendous, tremendous things. But Christ's definition of serving him is really much broader than that. You know, most of his teachings about serving him would probably be somewhat unpopular to the masses, even the masses of Christians. This morning we're going to look at a parable that Jesus told 
to an expert in the Jewish law who asked him a very direct and very straightforward question. If you have your Bibles with me, I'd like you to turn to the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. We're going to be reading verses 25 to 37. A very, very popular parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He, meaning Jesus, answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Jesus is telling this man, this man who is the expert in the Jewish law, that to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, requires a willingness on our part to serve. He says, loving the Lord your God, or loving your neighbor as yourself, means that you will be called upon to serve God. In fact, I think he's even saying something a little more radical than that. Jesus is telling us that what it really means to love God is really the essence of what it means to be willing to serve him as well. And that's really what Christ communicates throughout this whole parable. Jesus is really telling us three different aspects of service in this parable, and those different aspects are what we want to look at this morning. The first thing that Jesus tells us in this parable about service is that he's telling us that service and ministry, for the most part, will always be very inconvenient for us. Think about that for a minute. Think about the ministries that you've been involved with. Can you ever say that you've really been involved in a ministry that was convenient? As I was reading through this parable, I found myself wondering, was it any more convenient for this Samaritan man to stop than it was for the priest and the Levite? I doubt it. I imagine they both had places to go and people to see, but yet the Samaritan stopped. He probably, more than all of the, the other two as well, probably had more of a reason not to stop. You see, the Jews absolutely despised the Samaritans. They looked down on them because they descended from Gentiles, because they maintained their own priesthood, their worship was different, and to top it all off, they didn't worship in Jerusalem. Can you see what we're getting at here? This man really had no reason at all to stop and help this Jew, but he did anyways. He inconvenienced himself. You know, if you think about it, this man did more than just stop and help, but he really risked his own safety as well. The area between Jerusalem and Jericho was a very long, very winding road uh, that had a lot of big rocks that provided 
uh, lots of places for robbers to hide as well. How did this man know that these same robbers weren't going to jump out and get him? Jesus here is talking about, as I've said, a very radical kind of service, a kind of service that is willing to serve God even if at times it puts our own safety at risk. And this type of service is very inconvenient. Inconvenient service is also very tough, and those of us who are involved in ministries, many of you know that. It's difficult to work with people who are, are hurting and broken, as many of us do. But this is precisely what Christ is looking for. Christ is saying something else here. He's saying that, in fact, he's not looking for people to do crowd control for junior church on Sunday morning. Or he's not looking for people to do crowd control for Awana on Wednesday nights. What he's looking for is people who are willing to invest time and love and energy despite the personal cost to people. He's looking for a radical type of servant who will give it all despite whatever the cost is. You know, we have a couple of of youth leaders, well, really all of our youth leaders, but two in particular, uh, Chris and Ted, who worked with very difficult groups of boys. And uh, as I was preparing this, uh, this point, uh, I couldn't help but think of them as to how difficult it is to work with some of these guys. They are hurting. Many of them have been bruised in a spiritual sense, but yet they just keep plugging away. You know, service done for Christ will be tough. It will be inconvenient. But at the same time, God asks us to enter into this type of service and to enter this type of, of ministry. This is what Christ expects of us. Well, the second thing that this passage teaches us about service is that it must be motivated by compassion rather than obligation. And I think that this is a tough one for a lot of Christians because it really does cut to the whole motive of why we do ministry, doesn't it? Think about this. Are we serving because we really have a genuine compassion and love for those who we are serving? Or are we serving simply out of obligation? Are we serving because we feel that the job needs to be done and there's nobody else to do it? So we might as well be the one. God is calling us to serve because we have a genuine compassion for those who've been ambushed, beaten, stripped, and bruised in a spiritual sense. I often think that it's a very sad fact that most of us, including myself, really could do ministry without this sense of love and compassion for the people that we're working with. You know, nursery workers, Awana listeners, Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, people in the choir, think about this. If we're not doing it out of a motive of, of love and compassion, are we really accomplishing anything in the eyes of God? Are we really accomplishing anything that will have any lifelong value? If we don't have compassion, then we're just doing a job. We're just fulfilling a role. Oh, to have the love of this Samaritan man. Would you agree? What an example to us. You know what is really fascinating to me about this parable is that if you really think about it, each of these three men were completely justified by, by their religion in not stopping to help this man. You now, both the priest and the Levite would have incurred a ceremonial defilement if they had touched the man, and in fact, he had been dead. We can assume from the passage that the man appeared as dead, we can assume that he looked as if he had already died. So in order to maintain their ceremonial purity, both the Levite and the priest walked on the other side of the road. They were justified by their religion. But interestingly enough, the Samaritan also had, uh, would have incurred a ceremonial defilement if he had touched the man and he had been dead. But yet he made another choice. He showed compassion and he showed love. This passage tells us that the Samaritan man poured oil and wine on the beaten man's wounds. The oil at that time would have acted uh, as a painkiller more than anything to help ease the man's pain and suffering. 
where the wine, probably very expensive wine, would have acted as an antiseptic to clean the wounds and to prevent against any possible infection. The Samaritan bandaged the wounds and then did something else very interesting. He put the man on his own donkey, which would mean that he would have had to have walked the rest of the way. He took the man to a place where he could recover. This man's love and compassion was very, very sacrificial. You know, I think today oftentimes it's, it's too easy for us to put money in the offering plate and think that we are supporting our church programs, to think that we're serving the Lord by doing that. And we are. Our programs need finances, but I wonder how many of our programs need more than the money. They need us to commit ourselves to those programs. They need people with a strong compassion for people and a strong love for people. You know, I would rather have two radical BYM youth leaders who really believed this than I would 20 leaders who were working out of a sense of sinful obligation. And I think any ministry head would agree with that. I love the account of Jesus calling Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. Allow me to read it. You don't need to turn there. This is what he writes in Matthew 9. And Jesus went on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. He said, follow me. And he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and with the sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. Jesus says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous, but the sinners. I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. I find that section really interesting where it says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I love the way that the New American Standard Version puts it. He says, I desire compassion. He doesn't, it doesn't say mercy. It says, I desire compassion. So Jesus is saying, I desire compassion rather than obligation. My friends, this is what God expects of us in terms of us serving him. He expects that we will have a compassionate love for the people who we are serving. Well, the first thing that this passage said about service was that it would be inconvenient. The second thing was that it needed to be motivated by compassion rather than obligation. And the third point that we want to talk about tonight, this, to this morning, is that really our work is never done. You know, I don't know about you, but I really like jobs that I can look at and see the end of. I like jobs that I can see the light at the end of the tunnel or jobs that I can know what the goal is and have some very measurable way of knowing when we've come, reached that goal. Well, serving the Lord doesn't really offer us much of this, does it? We can finish one thing, but there's always so much more for us to do. This Samaritan gives us a tremendous example of this. Even after he found the man, dressed his wounds, took him to the inn, his job still wasn't finished, was it? Listen to what he did after that. It says, then he took him to the inn and took care of him. The next day, assuming that he spent a night with him, that's what we can get from this passage. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have incurred. The man stayed a night with him and did much more. He acted very much above and beyond the call of duty. You know, one commentary I read uh, said something very interesting about this two silver coins that this man gave the innkeeper. It said that that could have, at that time, paid for up to two months accommodations at that end. Two months accommodations. I wonder how many of us would be willing to go that far for those that we minister to. You know, I'm convinced that no ministry could survive without people like this who are willing to go 
the second mile. We need to be willing to go above, above and beyond what our job description tells us that we need to do. I wonder how many of us in our ministries tend to get frustrated when we don't see the dramatic spiritual results that we see Jesus and that we see Paul and the other apostles had. You know, sometimes I hear stories from missionaries who have been overseas for, for many, many years and who, uh, although they've been very dedicated in their service, have not seen a single convert. I remember at my last church, I had an opportunity to sit down for an afternoon and talk with one of these missionaries. And he said something that to this day um, has stuck with me. It was a very profound statement. This is what he said. He said, all I know is that I have done my very best and I have been obedient to what God has asked me to do. You know, as I heard him say that, I found myself thinking that the standard that we use to judge our own success is really very different than the standard that God uses to judge whether we're successful. You know, God doesn't ask us to succeed. He asks us to simply be obedient. He's not going to ask us when we get to heaven how many converts we've had. He's going to ask us whether we've shown compassion and whether we've been obedient to what he's asked us to do. I think that quite often, and I'll say this for myself, quite often uh, the tendency is for us to judge ministries by the number of students that are coming out, by the number of people who've been converted. And um, I think that what God is saying is that that is not the standard that he uses to judge our ministries. How obedient have we been? Have we shown compassion? Have we showed love? This is a lesson that I really need to learn. You know, I find the closing words in this story to be worth noting because it is a very direct statement by Jesus. And really what it does is it takes away all the guessing for each and every one of us about how it is that Christ wants us to apply this passage to our lives. Four very simple words. He says, go and do likewise. That is what he expects of us, that we will go and do likewise. Who are the battered and beaten and bruised and, and stripped that God has called you to minister to this morning, to minister to in this church and to serve? Now, God is calling us this morning to bandage their wounds and to take them to a place of refuge. But you know what? Our job isn't even done then because he's also asking us to stay with them. You know, service isn't something that God calls us to do. Being involved in a ministry isn't something that God specifically calls us to do, but it's more of a lifestyle that he calls us to live, isn't it? We've talked about three very negative things this morning about service, haven't we? We've talked about how service is inconvenient. We've talked about how service needs to be motivated out of compassion and love. And if it's not, if it's motivated out of a sense of obligation, then that just really doesn't cut it in God's eyes. And we've also talked about how the job really never ends. There is much more to do. Three negatives, but there is one gigantic positive in all of this. And I know that each and every one of you who've been involved in a ministry, been involved serving the Lord, would agree with me and that it's, it's totally, completely, 100% worth it. We'd all agree with that. You know, this morning, I want to call some of you into service, into a specific service. Our youth ministry in the month of October is going to be starting a new one-on-one -on -one mentoring program called One-on-One -on -one Impact. And our goal through that is to match youth from our church and to match youth from our community up one-to-one -one with a mature Christian adult. We're hoping that two very, very important things will be accomplished through that. We're the first and probably the most important to start off with would be that a friendship would develop. And the second would be that you would develop the role of a spiritual leader to the student that you're working with. I, I share this with you now because over the next few weeks you will be receiving more information on it and um, 
I hope that many of you would consider that. We're not looking at it as just another church program. We're really looking at it asking ourselves, God, what do you want to do through this? We believe that he's going to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what any of us could comprehend through that. We know that our students' lives are going to be changed, and we know that your life has the potential to be changed as well. Well, I believe this morning that Jesus wants to call each and every one of us into service, whether it be with what I've just challenged you with, whether it be with Maybe it's a call for you to recommit yourself to a ministry that you're presently involved with. Maybe you're being told this morning that you've done nothing for too long and it's time to do something. The time for you is now. And this is precisely what Christ expects of us. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we want to thank you for the privilege it is to serve you. And though it is all the things that we have mentioned, Lord, serving you is a tremendous, tremendous gift. Serving you is, the rewards are far greater than any of the negatives. Father, I would ask this morning that you would really be encouraging people, really be speaking to people and challenging people to get involved in some ministry this fall to recommit themselves, Lord, to, to showing love, to making that their motive for serving you. I ask that you would give them, even right now, a very special, a very deep compassion for the group that they will be serving with. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.